Uh, so I guess it's been six months and I still can't get over what happened here. And now the Game of the Year award goes to... Come on, you knuckleheads. The Last of Us Part 2. Missed it. Anyway, so it was only recently that I picked up and played Hades, which is probably why this all took so long. But it was motivated by this article by Zach Bennett on Destructoid.com that's basically about the thematic resonance of Hades and the year of 2020. Links are in the description, and much of the motivation that I have and the lens in which I use to read Hades can be found there, so you should really go check it out. Anyway, if you were wondering why Hades is such a good game and why it's recently got its dues uh, by the BAFTAs, DICE, and before then Destructoid giving it their game of the year of 2020, hopefully this video will illuminate some things for you because the game isn't just good or, you know, fun to play. Most game of the year contenders, sort of by definition, have to be mechanically and technically competent. No, what makes Hades special is that it has a lovely message. And that message is delivered through the language of video games. So right off the top of this, I want to preempt some things. First, spoilers ahead for the entirety of Hades, essentially. And second, I will be making a bunch of assumptions about how people lived in the pandemic and their experiences going through the game of Hades. So please keep that in mind. Unfortunately, I am trapped within this sack of meat and its pathetic senses. So unfortunately, I can only experience so much. With that out of the way, let's begin whatever the hell this is. And this time we are filled with renewed vigor to destroy you utterly. So we're locked in an endless cycle of violence, basically. I guess that's one way for you to pass the time here in this stodgy place. All right, Hades starts you immediately with Zagreus' first escape attempt. He is just sick of being stuck in that big old house and pushing parchment around. So unlike a game like Animal Crossing, which aims to deliver you the escape that you want, which is more or less, you know, freedom on your own personal deserted island, Hades aims to reflect your own suffering back at you. How we feel being trapped in our own homes is exactly how Zagreus feels at the start of the game. I don't want any of this. I'm not the one who drew the short lot with your brothers and got stuck here forever. Why am I having to do this senseless parchment pushing for you? So the parallels to 2020 and life in a pandemic are present right off the bat, but they don't end there. I am asking you to get me out of here. Permanently, if you catch my drift. The standing around stuff just kind of wears on you after a while, you know? So the most obvious thing about Hades and the pandemic is that it is a roguelike. So rather than having a more conventional level structure, the game is built on repeating essentially the whole game and having randomized elements that differentiate each run ever so slightly. Death or success, you are motivated to continually play the game from start to finish. So like those caught in quarantine or lockdown, or those of us trying to do right by others or themselves and were self-isolating, this sequence of respawning, going through the same chambers only to die and do everything over again, is quite similar to life in a pandemic. Everything just feels much more repetitive because all of the things you would normally do are now restricted to a single physical space. Hades, in its choice of genre, emulates that feeling because roguelikes are built to restrict an entire game to feel like one long level, whereas most games are broken up into set pieces, locations, story beats, or conventional levels, much like how life is compartmentalized into different locations like home, work, and the pub. In both instances, you're more or less doing the same things you would have before, but everything feels much more oppressive due to that extra restriction which leads to desires of escape, and in Hades, this is mainly achieved through self-improvement, which, as luck would have it, was also something that came up during the pandemic. Waste not your time, though it is limitless. Busy yourself in doing things of use. Learn. Learn how to learn. 
So early on in 2020, on you know the news and through various media and things like that, there was this sentiment of, well, you can't go to work. And even if you have to work from home, you've gained all that travel time back. So there was the sentiment of, hey, why don't you try and just be a better you, babe? You know, get a new skill, do some meditation, self-reflect, you know, just self-improve, yeah? Now, first, as one of those essential workers, this was not a thing for me at all. And also, knowing human nature, this was not something that was going to last. And if you think about the year, that kind of happened. That sentiment did fade away over time. But it was definitely something I remember being bombarded with early on. I don't think that I will ever eat sourdough ever again. Uh, goes down smooth. Now, Zagreus doesn't own an oven, thank God. But throughout the game, there are things that allow you to permanently upgrade slash unlock things that make a successful run much more likely. I'm going to focus here on the gems and darkness. So the gems, and I'm including the diamonds in this, are used predominantly as a currency to buy upgrades to your environment, like getting a nice poster for your room, and various other cosmetic changes. But things aren't purely cosmetic, as you are able to purchase things like fountain rooms that allow you a bit of a reprieve during your run. Since many of us were trapped in our own homes for so long, it became more important how we utilize the little space we had correctly, and these gems are somewhat analogous to that idea of investing resources to upgrade the space that you do have in order to ease your burdens. The house shall stand eternally, although in what condition it is ours to decide. Our obligation is to keep the house in order. Darkness is more of a personal thing, and it is a currency that is used predominantly to upgrade Zagreus himself. Spending your darkness gives you access to things like an additional dash, better healing, and basically the best thing, the ability to defy death itself. Now, the interface that you have to use in order to augment and upgrade Zagreus is a mirror. This is actually really neat from that whole symbolism and meaning, artsy fartsy sort of point of view, because in terms of expediency, it probably would have been easier if this system was more just a menu that you could just press a button in order to access as the player. But the thing is about self improvement and you kind of only really get there through self reflection so the choice to make that not something super easy and make it a kind of literal mirror within the game is actually a really good symbolic choice that Supergiant made there. I trust that the mirror in your bedchamber has proved satisfactory dear child. Better than I could have possibly imagined, Nyx. Alright, so let's assume now that you've been playing the game a bunch, dying plenty of times to traps, shades, and that bastard Theseus, or, you know, being a complete idiot trying to steal money from Charon. Um, Charon, look, I, I can explain. You incur the wrath of ancient Chthonic gods, and then are surprised to be destroyed by them. Have you learned nothing after all this time? No. Uh, but, otherwise, have managed to get enough points invested in yourself, and getting some lucky boons that you are able to escape for the first time. You walk through the snow for just a bit, and are greeted with this. A serene and beautiful sunrise. Your reward for escaping is to witness the beauty of nature. Beautiful. As a quick aside, I personally think uh, that that moment of relief, exhilaration and freedom is amplified by the level design of the Temple of Sticks. More than any other region, it feels much more claustrophobic, and I think that's because all of the chambers are really quick, but they're also really small, and they're just filled with enemies most of the time, and there's poison, and there's traps all over the place. And so I think having this very claustrophobic level design right before the moment of freedom and release is really good game design 
amplifying one feeling by contrasting with another. Good stuff. Anyway, you've escaped now. That's all there is to it, right? Nobody gets out of here, boy. Whether alive or dead. You think I jest? You think I haven't tried? From this point on with the game, it starts a slow but very important shift of motivation. See, after the sunrise, you keep going and meet Persephone, who turns out to be Sagrius's mother. But that's not important for now. What is important, though, is that just being outside of the underworld will kill Zagreus. The idea of escape is a lie, but the game gives you a new motivation. Connect with this new person. And the only way you can do that is to complete another run. Come back. I shall be waiting here. However long it takes. However long it takes. We all know that you're just gonna die again, but you're probably going to do it anyway because escaping the grind is no longer the focus. From this point on, you'll be using the grind in order to connect. Perhaps there really is no time quite like the present when it comes to showing thanks to one another, my dear cousin. The Mirror of Night is most likely a focal point of early game as it is the key to you clearing your first run, but sort of fades in your priorities because the last upgrades you get are really expensive. And once you've made one clear with a certain configuration, the likelihood of you not making a clear becomes much lower over time, unless you increase the difficulty through the Pact of Punishment. So the game in this way, similar to how things played out during the pandemic, shifts its narrative from improvement in order to be better and thus escape, to realizing that there is no escape and that the grind should be used to facilitate the beauty of connection. <laughs> mate, you are tough. <laughs> Got you, mate. Twice in a row. I guess Hermes wins his little wager with you then. You tell him I said... <sighs> I think where Hades' true strength lies isn't actually in the action. It's in the dialogue. The main source of praise for this game, I think generally speaking, was that every character seemed to always have something new to say. Now, mechanically, the game is also very solid. It has a variety of weapons and builds, and everything is very fluid. It's good stuff. But the thing is, all of the action stuff is one of the first things that you kind of figure out. And I think it's after that point in time for players that they realize, oh, hey, I keep getting new dialogue, like, all of the time. 10,000 souls have fallen to you now, my hellborn kin. I am rather beside myself, I must admit. Fine work. And often the dialogue will have references to things that you have previously done in the game, which makes the NPCs seem like they're much more invested in your plight. At the very least, it makes them feel like they see you as a player. Just look at yourself, Zyke. You are like a walking stockpile of ambrosia, aren't you? Taking the best care of it at that. I knew I could count on you, but I didn't know I could just be so proud of you, you know, man? And again, it is in this additional way that the game shifts focus from the self to connections. You think less and less about the mirror and how you're playing? Hmm and thinking more about the other characters. It's hard being alone all of the time. At least I have Callisto and the other nymphs, and I have you. A distant friend is still a friend, isn't that right? By embracing the repetition that's inherent in its genre, Hades never feels repetitive, because whenever you die, rather than thinking negative thoughts of doing everything again, your thoughts go to, oh sick, I wonder what old mate Skelly has to say this time. Finally, free, boyo. Farewell, Skelly. What? <laughs> Got you pretty good again, didn't I, boyo? I am asking you to get me out of here. <laughs> So, so here's the thing about the birds, okay? 
They're a major part of the game, they're powerful things, and without them you most likely won't be able to complete a run, but the fact that they are temporary and limited to that specific run is, I think, indicative of their true value. So for us mere mortals in a rough spot, I think boons are analogous to well wishes and deliveries of food or, or you know toilet paper. They are a temporary uplift to try and get you through the day. As a roguelike, the things that are permanent have a much larger significance in terms of mechanical progression. So these temporary boons are nice and all, but I think that they represent one-way connections. They're just voicemails that the Olympians send to Zagreus. I might check up on you there, boss. You doing well? Everything good and all? Can't hear you one I to mind, so then don't answer that. But in order to get the higher value, permanent things in the game, you need to forge stronger bonds. A Cathonic companion. Do so, really. You're the best. You do that within the limited mechanics of Hades by giving them nectar and then ambrosia. These items aren't easy to come by and act as a form of currency, so giving them away is a sign of how much you value whomsoever you dole them out to. Relationships in life are much the same. Lasting relationships are built on reciprocity. So if you lavish me with gifts, why, what am I to do but give you something in return? Effort and value needs to be seen by both sides or else they are doomed to failure. Your mates, huh? Just as long as you don't count on him for anything. Hasn't even mentioned me, has he? So Hades rewards the player by giving them the much more valuable keepsakes for the initial act of giving and then the Chthonic companions when things are closer to maxed out. Now I say things are more powerful because mechanically they are permanent, they are robust in that they can be swapped out and replaced in the middle of a run, and they are also not affected at all by the Pact of Punishment. Which leads me to the conclusion that mechanically the game is saying that these are better than boons, i.e. two-way relationships are better than one-way relationships. I think you could be my best friend. Have you tried being my best friend? I'll have to give that a shot. Alright, so, so far, we've only really looked at progression up to the end of the first clear. So let's look at what the player will likely be doing after that point. It takes about 10 clears in order for Zagreus to convince Persephone to come back home, and essentially patch things up with her and everyone down there. You get a nice boat ride down as the credits roll, so I suppose everything from that point on is post-game, but that's kind of a really fuzzy area to talk about with regards to roguelikes, so I will just refer to everything in the following segment as post-game, as that is how I progressed. But these things may well have happened to you before the credits rolled. Anyway, there is still more to do if you're keen after you have achieved the return of Persephone to the Underworld. She even gives you the task of befriending all of the Olympians for a super secret special plan, which, if you follow through, has them all come down to the underworld for a big ol' dinner party. Now, if that is not reflective of the desire of many of those in lockdown, I'm not quite sure what is. But anyway, with that macro look at the game, we can see a sort of pattern. In order to connect with Persephone, we need to do some grinding. But then, that also becomes a grind, but it facilitates the connection to her and the underworld. And then she sets your task after that to connect everyone together. This pattern repeats itself all over the game. You think about all of the other shades and the end goal for basically like all of their little quests or whatever. It's to repair their relationships. You've got Achilles and Patroclus. You've got Eurydice and Orpheus. Heck, even Zag and Meg. Nyx and Chaos. Remember, the game ends up being about connections and the fact that so much of the post-game is essentially, hey, repair everyone's relationships, which, you know, in real life is tremendously difficult to do. I don't think any of that is a coincidence. Don't believe me? Well, check this out. I left out one shade there. Your boy and mine, 
Sisyphus. Now, he has a pretty stable relationship with his pal Baldi, so there's nothing to really repair there, but let's see what he has to say after Zagreus frees him from his contract. You mean you're really going to stay, even though you don't have to? Is that so odd, Highness? I don't see myself logging old Baldi out of here besides. And if I were to leave, why, we would not be having these exchanges now and then. I happen to enjoy them quite a bit. Now, here you go, and thank you very much. Huh. So old mate Sisyphus reckons that he'll just stick around because it's important to him that he sees Zag. He is not willing to give up the grind because he might lose his connection to Zagreus. This is the grand narrative told within the microcosm of this one piece of dialogue. From here, if we zoom out to the level of a single run of the game, we have these four zones. Tartarus, Asphodel, Elysium, and then the Temple of Styx. Notice which shades appear in which zones. Sisyphus, the embodiment of repetition, seeing as how his punishment is to repeatedly push a boulder up a hill only for it to fall down and him having to do that again, is placed in Tartarus, the first zone. Next we have Eurydice, who is placed in Asphodel, Patroclus is next in Elysium, and we end things with, you know, Hades and Persephone as there are no shades in the Temple of Styx. It's the same pattern. Repetition to start, and then everything else is all about connections. Zooming out even further than that, across the entirety of what your experience with the game will probably be like, and it is this. We focus on the mirror in order to achieve your first escape. Every other clear will be focused on repairing your relationship with Persephone, which is basically 10 clears. And then every run after that is devoted to repairing the relationship between the Olympians and the Underworld. It's the same pattern again. Uh, so this last part is the least likely to translate to your specific run, since you might have done 30 to 50 attempts before your first clear, and could have spent that time chumming it up with the Olympians and the other shades, such that this pattern doesn't really work. But check this out. Let's have a look at the weapons. All of them start with first, and the cheapest aspect, Zagreus. So repetition and the self. And then every other aspect is unique and is a connection to another former or future wielder. So seeing this pattern throughout the game in so many places and expressed with so many different game specific things, I think is what makes Hades special. It cannot be told as a movie and these patterns only exist because Hades is a video game and through them, we can ascertain what the game is about. Reading the game through this lens, the conclusion that I come to is that Hades is about living life. We first acknowledge the repetition that all of us must face, but have to recognize that it facilitates what has true value, which are the bonds that we forge. Then one fine morning you just walked into my life. And here we are. I still cannot entirely believe it. What I mean is... I love you, son. I'm doing my best. I know. I love you too, mother. So the beauty of Hades, compared to, say, overly long movie that I guess will put levels in so that it will qualify as a video game is that not only does it have an actually good message that you could take with you and live your life by, but that that message is clear and it's expressed by the story, the gameplay progression, 
and the mechanics as well as various other things. The message is also not contradicted by anything else in the game in a meaningful way either. And so despite that ludicrous display in December, I think that Hades is like on an artistic prestige level absolutely the game of the year for 2020 since it just beautifully conveys its narrative and that it actually uses the medium it is in to do so. But there's more to it than just that because on a certain level you can always disagree with me because you enjoyed the other game and have constructed this narrative that it makes sense to you. That's fine. That's why art is subjective. I brought that up before within this very video about Hades. Your progression through the game might not match mine and thus you will have a different narrative. Okay? But here's the thing about that. 2020 was a year defined by a pandemic. We started having movies and other art that just spoke to us a little bit more because they just captured the experience we were going through. Hades starts out with a yearning to escape, and I think that feeling is there regardless of whether you are locked down or not. In Hades, gods die in order to repeat, but for us mortals, we sleep, and for both, repetition is inescapable. For most of us, what we did, whether it was in lockdowns, quarantines, self-isolation, it didn't really change from normal life. These actions were just confined to a physical space so that it felt worse than normal. The year was still a year. The seasons rolled around as they always did. Schedules were still months and weeks. Mondays were still Mondays. Everybody hang in there. You woke up, you ate breakfast, then lunch, then dinner, and then you go to sleep. Repeat, that's a day, regardless of lockdown. The real difference, and the thing that we truly lost compared to a normal year, wasn't, you know, toiling for some corporation. It was visiting family or going to the pub with your mates. It was connection that we were missing. So having a game that mirrored that sentiment so clearly come out in that year symbolically should have made it the game of 2020 unequivocally that's that thing hope you enjoyed the show my good shade Hello everyone, um, so this is editing Tommy, and I just thought I'd end this video with, you know, a nice message. In the spirit of the game, tell your mom that you love them, and maybe, you know, just maybe, reconnect with someone that you may have lost along the way. You never know, it could lead to something beautiful. I did not guess that one evening you would provide for me both such a gift and such a sentiment. Well, I mean every word. I love you, Nix. I love you too, my child.